male obesity associated with hypogonadism, the secondary hypogonadism. Obesity, as we all know, is the biggest villain today, and it's a multifactorial state of uh, body, I should say. Should I really call it a disease? I don't know. But it's multifactorial. Besides the environment, besides the behavior, it is also sometimes attributed to genetics. So we have a multifactorial state which has been blamed for diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, and many more things. And now, ACP Scientific Committee wants to blame it for secondary hypogonadism as well. So are we really right or are we really wrong? Let's see. So hypogonadism, as we understand, is a state of androgen deficiency. And this androgen deficiency, besides having other factors, mostly affects the psyche, the mind, the quality of life. So it has two components. Either we talk of sperm count, which is either reduced, or the sperm motility, which is again affected. Or secondly, we talk of the testosterone, that is the male hormone. So deficiency of male hormone or some alteration of sperms. Both will be labeled as a state of hypogonadism. So what are the types of hypogonadism that we are talking? First of all, we will talk of anything going wrong at the testicular level. So anything going wrong at the end organ level, at the gonadal level, we label it as primary hypogonadism. Then anything going wrong at the central level, hypothalamus or pituitary, we will label it as secondary hypogonadism. And obesity has been blamed or charged with secondary hypogonadism. So just a brief to complete the forum or complete the protocol, we have a list of causes of primary hypogonadism, which we are not interested in this session. We are only interested in secondary hypogonadism. So secondary hypogonadism, it can also be genetic or congenital. So when we talk of congenital secondary hypogonadism, which we will not be discussing here, basically has a lot of syndromic etiologies. So when we talk of a lot of syndromic etiologies, we do talk of Kalman syndrome. We are not interested today. Then we have some pituitary disorders. Most commonly, we have the hyperprolactinemias. Then we have the inflammatory disorders, which may go and infiltrate the pituitary. Again, we will not be talking of these two conditions. We will only be talking of something new, and that is obesity also causing secondary hypogonadism. And this etiology labeling, I have not done. It is there in the books, very well recognized and accepted. So we have a lot of papers going on. We have a lot of studies already going on. And there are people already studying this topic. And one of the latest article which I have picked up is obesity as a serious etiological factor for male subfertility in modern society. Again, another topic picked up recently from the Willi uh, Journal, hypogonadism and male obesity. Let us focus on some unresolved questions. So my scientific committee is very much on the right track. We have something new which we are discussing today. So now for the house. Please be very alert. We have Mr. A. He's 50 years and BMI is 40 kilograms per meter square, right? We have Mr. B, he's 75 year old. He has a BMI of 35 kilograms per meter square. No other medical condition existing. Only difference is 40, 35, 50, 75. We have another person, Mr. C sitting somewhere in our, uh, in our clinics, 50 years old gentleman with a BMI of 35 but he has a type 2 diabetes of 10 years, which is uncontrolled. So he has HbA1c of 12. We have another gentleman in our chambers, Mr. D, 60 years, BMI 35, history of diabetes same, 10 years, but a controlled diabetes. All four coming with the same complaint of low libido. You send which sample? Serum, testosterone. Agreed or not? Yes. And what is the result you are expecting? 
Any guesses? Keep your homework ready. I'll come back to this question. What will be the testosterone in all four cases? So what are the other terms which we shy away from maybe? But there are terms. We do talk of, sir, talked of menopause and HRT in women, but we do forget male menopause. We do forget the terms like male climacteric or andropause. There are conditions like Adam, partial Adam, or aging. And now we will soon be adding obesity. So what are the unresolved questions that we really are going to learn today before we leave the session? What are the chances of HPT excess suppression with obesity association? To what extent do these men actually have the symptoms? Is it bidirectional? Is it obesity causing hypogonadism or hypogonadism causing obesity? How does it all happen? How should we manage? And do we have some role of SERMs or the aromatase inhibitors? So I will just explain how it actually happens in one slide. You'll have to stay with me for this slide, please. So this is a very simple and interesting slide. What really happens? There is obesity. It's a stage of chronic inflammation. There is accumulation of adipose tissue. And what does adipose tissue do? It will metabolize your testosterone to estradiol. And there is estradiol accumulation which will cause hypogonadism. This will also cause gynecomastia. Then this chronic inflammation will lead to oxidative stress. This oxidative stress will denature your sperm morphology. Then it will denature your sperm motility. Finally, it will kill your sperms. So the sperm count will fall. So there is decrease in sperm count, motility, and morphology, right? Then there is something called scrotal fat. We have learned since our very initial years as biology students that why is the scrotum outside the body? Because testes is one organ which requires low temperature. Heat damages it. But what are we doing? With the increase of intrascrotal adiposity, there is increased lipogenesis, there is increased local heat production, which causes destruction of the testes and which causes destruction of the sperms. So there is change at the testicular level, that is the local milieu is altered, systemic milieu is altered. As a result, there is sperm dematuration, decrease in sperm functioning and sperm count and sperm motility. That is not all. The story is not over. There's another interesting concept, and that is epigenetics. Now, these altered sperm, when passed on to the next generation, the inheritance is also passed on. So entire metabolic syndrome is gifted to the next men or the next generation males. So the next generation males also grow up to be obese, prone to cardiovascular diseases, and hypogonadism. So that is the entire story of obesity and hypogonadism. So what is the clinical picture? How will these males present? Increased BMI, increased fat mass, and decreased muscle mass. They will have smaller penis, smaller scrotal size. They will have low hair, pubic hair growth will be less. There can even be regression of the pubic hair and the axillary hair. Loss of libido, stress, frustrations, conflicts, quality of life impaired, gynecomastia. And they will come to any one of us. And the set of investigations that we all know what we will be prescribing, LH, FSH, testosterone, prolactin, a standard set of tests. So we look for the clinical signs and we look for the lab values. The clinical symptoms and signs, it can be a prepubertal uh, boy also. So you can have that the child is not developing beard and mustache. Or if there were beard and mustache, there has been regression. The shaving frequency has been reduced. 
There is development of gynecomastia, and the ch uh, parents are running from pillar to post to find out the cause and treat it. And the answer is mostly cosmetic. We go for plastic surgeries. Early morning testosterone levels, LHFSH levels, prolactin levels, and in older uh, males, we are also using PSAs. If the child is prepubertal, it's mandatory to rule out the congenital causes also. So we have to look for the primary causes as well, and we have to look for the secondary causes as well. And we are also looking for, in case of post-pubertal, again, we look for signs and symptoms along with primary as well as the secondary causes. So this is the algorithm. How do we go about it? I'm not much interested in this algorithm because this is something I understand that we all know. As a protocol and as just to complete the forum, because it is secondary, we are not much concerned with karyotyping, but in pre-pubertal boys, if they're coming to you, just go for one karyotyping as well. Then radiological imaging becomes important. You are looking for pituitary, you might find some mass, or in cases of uh, uh, MRI pelvis, you might find some undescended testes. So these are all causes just to complete the picture of your investigations. Then comes your most important thing in oldies, in the older generation. We were talking of fractures and osteoporosis in women. We cannot forget osteoporosis in men, and testosterone is one of the important causes. So we have to look for all these things. Then also, again, we have to look for prostate. There is change in cognition, intelligence, and mood. So your psychoanalysis, again, becomes very important. Now I'm coming back to my primary question in the four cases, the serum T. Which of the four ABCD will have the minimum testosterone? D. You want me to go back to that slide? Interestingly, I'll just disclose, open the card. Interestingly, the testosterone levels will be low in all four, irrespective of the values here and there. This gentleman, though young, is morbidly obese. This gentleman, though not morbidly obese, but is aging. This gentleman is having middle age, morbid, like moderate obesity, but a comorbidity which predisposes things and accelerates the things. This gentleman has controlled comorbidity, but a moderate BMI and aging. So all the four scenarios clinically are almost the same. So that becomes very interesting to understand that obesity alone may not be having that big a factor when obesity is combined with the comorbidities. And those comorbidities are aging and metabolic conditions. So you are accelerating your own vehicle. Okay, coming to the second important question, is it bidirectional? How much is it bidirectional? So there is hypothalamus, there is hypopituitary axis, there is something called sex hormone binding globulin. So in cases of moderate obesity, there may be some decrease in testosterone, but that total testosterone fall is because of the fall in SHBG. The free testosterone is still normal. So patient may not be clinically having severe symptoms of hypogonadism, but he will have some symptoms of hypogonadism clinically. And on evaluation, you will find that the free testosterone is still normal. It is only the total testosterone which is falling initially because of the fall in sex hormone binding globulin. It is only when the patient is severely obese, there is severe rise in adipose tissue, that there is higher conversion of estradiol, and this adipose tissue, because of the leptins and the adipokines, is causing secondary hypogonadism. So the gain in adipose tissue because of hypogonadism is less. So though the case is bidirectional, but it is the obesity which is causing hypogonadism and not vice versa. So how do we manage? I have five minutes. I will just rush through it. So how do we manage a case of male hypogonadism because of obesity? The goal of the therapy is to restore the sexual function and the quality of life, to maintain virilization, and more importantly, to maintain bone density and prevent osteoporosis. We have to possibly normalize the growth hormone levels as well. 
we have to decrease the cardiovascular risk and restore fertility in cases of young males. So how can we do that? Number one is always lifestyle modification. Though lifestyle modification may not restore the body weight, but it will increase your lean muscle mass. It will decrease the fat mass. If the total fat, the total weight may not change drastically, but the whatever change happens positively will affect the fat loss and increase the muscle mass. So there will be symptomatic benefit with lifestyle modification. If you want a definite answer in terms of weight number, then the answer is bariatric surgery because lifestyle modifications are difficult to maintain on the long term basis. So if you want definite answers in terms of your numbers, or number of the weights, the kgs or the BMI, you need to work with bariatric surgery and then follow the LSM. And of course the testosterone replacement therapy is the mainstay. You need to replace testosterone and testosterone replacement therapy is the mainstay of the treatment of hypogonadism with obesity or without obesity. If you are looking for fertility, then testosterone is not the answer. If you are looking for fertility, then you can go for HCG. If a boy is coming to you pre-pubertal and you need to induce puberty, then the answer is again HCG or you can even go for GnRH analogs. The newer molecules like the SERMs or the aromatase inhibitors, the anestrozoles, they are not having much significant proven role so far. So this is about male hypogonadism and obesity and the management.